Hello, this is Jane Coombs of WorkingWellSolutions.com and today I'm going to be talking about spirometry in the occupational health setting. Now this is quite a long presentation, I'm going to whip through quite a lot of the technical slides but you will be able to stop it and go back at any stage and see uh, what you've missed. Uh, there's also a video of um, how to do a spirometry on my website which is www workingwellsolutions.com that's all hyphenated let's get started so this is a spirometry workshop and the first part is the theoretical part and this is the part I'll be covering in this particular presentation and here you can see the objectives of what we'll be trying to do what we're doing here is a process of external respiration and what you can see here is the diffusion and this is how air goes into the lungs from a higher pressure to the lower pressure until the pressure is e equal. Um, well, we have the diaphragm flattens and makes this area larger increasing the volume of the chest cavity reducing the pressure in the lungs and so the air rushes in from outside and then the diaphragm relaxes lowering the volume of the chest cavity and the air rushes out it's a very logical process so why do we do spirometry well in the workplace it's mainly to do with respiratory sensitizers um, but it can be known to be used for welfare um, issues such as smoking and as an aid to health promotion so those are the reasons why you would do this. Types of occupational lung diseases that are, are um, prevalent. And we've got occupational asthma, asbestosis, coal miners lung, psittacosis and silicosis and farmer's lung. So these are occupational lung disease, which means they're all linked to an occupation that somebody's doing. So they're linked to work from health at work point of view, it's very important that we actually monitor people's health to make sure that their work is not affecting them adversely. So occupational asthma is the most frequently diagnosed respiratory disease in Great Britain and you can see you've got some statistics there. But the sad thing about occupational asthma is very debilitating. So not only could you lose your job because you'd be sensitised to a substance at work, but you also be very sick and poorly because of it. Symptoms, um, I suspect you've all seen people with asthma, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath and tight feeling in the chest. And of course, people can have asthma coming into the workplace and they can work with substances that can actually make their asthma worse as well. The symptoms can occur during exposure or very frequently sometime afterwards so people can get problems in the evening after they've been working with a, a, an irritant or a sensitizer. And in at the early stages of um, occupational asthma, the symptoms will disappear at weekends. So a very relevant question is to ask if symptoms get better when they're on holiday or at weekends. And may start with rhinitis and develop into asthma. So if somebody starts to develop symptoms of hay fever, then you may begin to suspect that asthma could be around the corner. The diagnosis of occupational asthma should only be done after stringent clinical tests have been carried out and should not be done on history. Um, and this is likely to involve serial peak flow readings, possible skin prick tests, possibly challenge tests if there are such tests against each substance, but always by a chest physician or occupational health physician. Here are the leading causes for occupational asthma. So why are we doing these spirometry checks in the workplace? We're going to protect the individual employee. We're going to detect at an early stage any changes to the health because if you identify at an early stage then you may be able to stop or reverse what's happened. You're assisting in evaluating the control measures by the employer. And data may be used for detection of hazards and assessment of risk. So any information you collect on health surveillance should be fed into your risk assessment processes on site. 
Health surveillance on the respiratory system is required by some laws um, to do with work. You've got the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. You've got the Control of Substances Hazardous to Health Regulations, that's COSH, and then the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations. There's also other laws which are more specific to specific substances. If you wish to know about those, you'd need to go to the Health and Safety Executive site for more information. Spirometry itself. One thing that I like to just make a point of is that most people say we're going to do a vitalograph and that really confuses employers and employees and vitalograph is a brand name the same as a hoover is a vacuum and I prefer to call it spirometry or what's better keep it simple and let's just talk about a breathing test for um, people that don't understand the technical terms and it should be used in conjunction with questionnaires. So the questionnaire is a self-reporting of symptoms and then you do the clinical test to support or disprove what the person is saying. When to undertake health surveillance for occupational asthma? It's based on the risk assessment of how much substance the person would be exposed to, the time, the type of person, the type of work and control measures. So it's based on a risk assessment process. If it's high risk, then there's more surveillance. If there's low risk, then it can be just minimum. And you can take your program from the bullet points here. You should be doing pre-placement or pre-employment baseline with a spirometry and questionnaire. Then if it's high risk, it's a six weeks and 12 weeks questionnaire. And then annually you should be looking at spirometry and questionnaire if it's high risk. If it's low to moderate risk, then you'd need to adapt your program accordingly. The procedure for spirometry is as below. The interesting part there for me is contraindications to spirometry, making sure that you're not going to do any harm by doing the process itself. And that's all to do with the preparation of the individual and the letter that's gone out to prepare that person. You then talk about the results with the individual, talk it through how what's happened, what the results are, any letters or reports are filled in. You complete a health record as specified by COSH and you explain to the individual how to protect themselves from health risks in the workplace and that's a fundamental function of doing the spirometry procedure there's very much a health education element to it so because I mentioned contraindication there's a list of uh, the contraindications and the interesting one there is the raised blood pressure and many people won't have had their blood pressure done ever and you need to make sure that uh, you're undertaking blood pressure monitoring prior to spirometry. Some do's and don'ts, I'll leave you to read those. But again, the one that's most important is the implication of medication taken like puffers or inhalers as they will interfere with the reading. And you need to take that into account when you're looking at the results of spirometry. So the technique Nowadays we seat individuals, on, in, when I first started they all used to stand up and I must say that individuals do find it easier to stand up, they put more effort into it. But it is an upright position, you explain the procedure, you demonstrate the procedure, make sure there's a good seal, use a nose clip or hold the nose. Um, you're doing the best of three blows and that means it's within 5% or 100 mLs. And then if, if they're not managing it, because most people struggle if they've never done it before, then you can do up to eight blows to get a satisfactory result. Normal ventilatory function is usually set by each individual company, but generally it's looking at about 80% of the normal. Abnormal results, again, are set by individual companies and the substances. And here we have what would be considered generic abnormal results. Now there's three results that can come out of a spirometry. You can get obstructive ventilatory function, something like asthma, 
bronchiectasis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, restrictive ventilatory function, pleural disease, pneumothorax, this is where the lungs aren't able to expand and contract as they should do, or a combination of both, which can be very, very disabling. Here are some of the technical slides I was talking about, and you may want to focus on these. And this is the curve that you see from the spirometry. This is a normal curve. And here you can see the measurement of one second. And it's calculated by these calculations here. I have to say that most machines nowadays which do the spirometry calculate this, but it's as well to understand what you're measuring. The restrictive, this is the second diagnosis I was talking about. You can see the curve is much flatter. Um, and then obstructive, you can see again, it's as high, but this second coming out of the lungs is taking much longer. And this is the two combination of obstructive and restrictive. And you can see the patterns there and how that's calculated. As I say, it's, it comes out of reading on most of the modern machines. So now you'll be undertaking a practical session and there'll be a demonstration of undertaking spirometry and an opportunity for you to practice spirometry in a safe environment. There is available on my website. There's also an assessment now, a short theoretical assessment, eight questions taken from the session content which is here on these slides and you'll get a certificate of attendance after supervised spirometry and satisfactory performance you'll get a certificate of competence issued by your clinical supervisor. The Bible for, if you like, occupational asthma is BORF, and here is the hyperlink. More information about health surveillance for asthma, and if you go to the HSE website, there's lots of information about respiratory sensitizers and occupational lung disease. If you would like the full slide show with notes, do drop me a line at jane.coombs at workingwellsolutions.com that's hyphenated and I hope you enjoyed this training presentation